we're going to switch gears now. So first, first part of the day was really broad procurement perspective on the domain. Uh, and we went a bit into some areas of process as well. And then you saw from Milan uh, go deep into sourcing. Um, I was still a high level because of the time. So now we're going to move into digital transformation. Uh, and then we'll cover this mid part of the day through first the digital transformation and then um, getting into artificial intelligence and then supply chain with artificial intelligence. And then the last part of the day will be on sustainability. So, and in the middle, we'll also post lunch have uh, a panel uh, on uh, with some of the Inside Plum employees. So you'll hear from them and uh, especially focused on women. So you'll hear from, you know, how people are managing careers in procurement. So let's go through this now. Um, I'll skip through some slides. There's a lot of slides out there. But really high level. Now, if you think, okay, you got in a company, you got procurement process, but or you got a procurement team. But where companies are struggling is if the processes are manual. If the processes are manual, as you saw in the presentation before from Milan, you know, it's not all about pricing, right? It's a lot about process efficiency, compliance. So with manual processes at the speed of business, you're not able to simply cope up with the business side demand or the, or the, or the, the needs of the business with manual processes. You also need a lot more resources. Um, so procurement that's running manual processes is, is more or less op is getting uh, absolutely obsolete. What also happens with manual processes is is the suboptimal stakeholder experience, which we talked about. Because in your personal lives, now you're used to a much better digital experience. So to have suboptimal processes or processes that really slow you down in business, you know, it really leads to employee uh, dissatisfaction. Also, suppliers are used to better processes with other companies. So again, you are not a professional procurement unit anymore in front of your suppliers as well, if you are not uh, set up properly in terms of your uh, uh, being digitally enabled uh, for to run your procurement processes. And then the other key parameter here is the saving leakage. So there's a lot of um, missed saving opportunity by not having the right tools in place to in enable those processes or enforce those processes. For example, we talked about tactical sourcing or the three bids by, you could easily have a tool enforce that, and that means you will always get those savings. You could always have the tool enforce that, hey, this is the buying channel, so when you buy a certain category, buy through this way. If you don't have a tool, you'll miss it. Or if you have a contract compliance built in in the tool, you know that, okay, you will realize those um, uh, savings. For example, these rebates, uh, you have the travel commodity, even the company I worked earlier, we had 50 million in rebate coming through. So even if the ticket would look, let's say, 10 pounds more than what you'd get on Sky Scanner, Sky Scanner or something, at the end of the year, the company got 50 million back as rebate. Why it was possible is because the systems allowed that to, to take place. Um, and then we talked about this earlier, right? Limited procurement influence. So if you want procurement to have a key seat at the table, you need procurement to work hand in hand with business, then the procurement needs to have a strategy to make sure that they influence the business. So you're not able to do that without effective tools. So with that context, let's go into, um, I'll skip some of this, but broadly speaking, what are the pain points when you do manual process? Um, very little compliance, it takes long time to do stuff. There is no consistent way of doing stuff. The suppliers are also don't know how to deal with you. Um, you may have incorrect information. You may have simple things like duplicate invoices. Of course, poor compliance, um, long approval cycles, you know, delays basically. And nobody has visibility of spend, but you are really burdened with tactical work. The procurement department is just doing um, work that could easily be automated or could be easily done in a tool. 
So they could do more strategic work like relation management or category management or do their market research. So because they are stuck with operational tasks, they're not able to do more strategic tasks. Uh, and of course, you're not as a procurement department, you're not able to support your business, right? So this is these are kind of the pain points. So procurement has moved on from this. In general, uh, procurement has moved on. But if you look at the context of small and medium companies, they're going through this churn and going through the cycle till they adopt a procurement function, set up the process, set up the tools. Uh, you are seeing this churn in companies. So what's really the driver for digital procurement? It's it's these things, right? The suboptimal processes, the manual processes, the saving leakages. These are your key reasons why you should anyway look at digital transformation. What does it give you? More value, more saving, more service quality for your business, more scope for innovation, more efficient controls, uh, embedded compliance into your processes. And also you are able to scale with the business needs. You're able to adapt and, and work with the business needs. So technology is just an enabler. Obviously underlying is the process that we saw earlier before the break, right? So a good process, a mature organization will enable a good process in the tool. And then, like I said, it's what, how do you are seen externally? Now, if I look at any company today, and if I want to do business with them and I see that actually they don't have a supplier registration, or they don't have a section for suppliers, it immediately tells me the level of maturity on the procurement side that they have, right? I don't know whether you agree with me or not, but in a second, you know that, right? That's the first thing I check as a procurement person is, okay, how mature are they? Then accordingly, I act as a, as a, well, I hope my customers are not hearing this, but normally, you know, so you, you know that, and then you know your strategy. You would know, okay, people who have an organized function have tools or a more uh, professional, uh, projection of a procurement unit, the supplier will give you more discount. The supplier will know that this is more competitive. When when you don't see a professional procurement unit, you will see that you will also not get the best value from your suppliers. So even to extract best value, you should really be more, I mean, it's a no-brainer really. So again, I don't want to bore you with theory slides, but Basically, there is cost saving, there is efficiency, and there is to support growth. You need digital. You need for spend visibility um, to manage your cash better. You just need procurement. Here, I'll give you a simple example that we went through the process. This is an example of a REBA system running source to pay, but this could be pretty much any software or also could be a combination of software. But I'll simply explain this to you. So what you see in green is what we talked about earlier in the class as upstream activity. So the thing that your procurement does, right? It's trying to analyze spend, it's trying to find the right suppliers, it's trying to qualify the right suppliers, negotiate with them, then monitor their performance, sign contracts with them. It's all this process is done digitally. And you see on the other side, on the right, you see the Ariba network is where the suppliers are. So suppliers are also collaborating with the procurement or the business online, or you can say digitally, right? It's going back and forth. So the color corresponds to that, right? So green part, so they register profiles there. It's like the Facebook for them, for Facebook for suppliers. So they would register their profile. At the same time, business is looking to find suppliers for a certain category, for a certain location. They can look them up, right? Now imagine if you didn't have this process if you had to only negotiate across a table. So I would fix a meeting. People would come and meet me in a room and go back. Then I have another vendor come in, meet me and go back. And then I have to go back to the first vendor and then get a better offer, then contact the other vendor and then so on, right? So if imagine multiple vendors means how much time it takes me on the procurement side to actually get the right supplier at the right rate. By the time my business need would have probably been out of the window, the business would have probably already done business with someone else, right? So this offline method doesn't work anymore. So you need digital tools, you need collaboration, also you need visibility. You are able to, in a tool, have your business partners also engaged. So business can be part of the approval flows or they can see the visibility, they can be part of the decision-making, 
Um, so everyone has more visibility. So now if you see the process, so once the, let's say the qualification is done, the contract is signed, you are able to also carry out key terms of the contract and put it into a catalog. Catalog is what your end user cares about. When he goes to a searching app, he goes to an app where he wants to buy, they should be able to easily search and look for items. If they look up for item or service and they find the right guided buying, the right channel to what they want to buy, that is the success for procurement. So as a benchmark, I mean, if you are at least 40% plus on catalogs is, is what is kind of okay, but you can go up. So if you're not even cataloging 40%, you're probably really behind. Now, this is coming from uh, manual ways to digital, where these metrics are good. Where the industry is actually headed is, why actually have even catalogs? Why have contracts in-house? Why have 200, 300 people teams just maintaining catalogs? You don't need all this. We are getting into more a model of commodity marketplace, a marketplace for everything. For example, what is Uber? What is Airbnb? They're marketplace. They're just marketplace. They govern the price by market dynamics. And you, what did Uber do, for example? Uber just disrupted the whole taxi industry, right? The mini cabs and the other cabs. You don't need to look up numbers. You don't need to do the technologies in your phone. You use it. So it's just a marketplace of rather than every company trying to maintain a certain information that goes obsolete in due course, you're just buying out of a marketplace. So the world overall, or the industry overall, I think is moving towards marketplaces. So if you come up with more and more commodity marketplaces, you will have lesser need to have in-house catalogs. But in-house catalogs are at least, let's say a first step for companies that have contracts, loads of contracts. I know a lot of companies, big companies, they have even with one vendor, 200 contracts around the globe and they don't know which one to look up when they don't even have a way to search from their contracts like i said to you right they are like drawers they are literally like contracts sitting in a drawer mean nothing to business so digital actually changes all this right even in digital it's like how you save how you uh, enable the process otherwise even digitally you could have a lot of junk um I mean, imagine even just sorting your photos, for example, or sorting through your work folders. Unless you have them organized, they are junk, right? So same applies to business. So then let's go to, uh, from contract, you go to catalog. Now what is happening on the, the buyer side is that they are uploading a catalog on their website, on the supplier portal. And they're able to push that catalog to different buyers. So what it means is that you're basically, why should I have as a supplier to service 200 customers, you know, manually give them files. I'm just able to maintain my catalog once, upload my catalog, and I can push preferential pricing or different pricing or specific customer specific pricing to different uh, customers of mine. But I don't need 200 copies of my own catalog. And also, I need to update my catalog. My prices change, my product change, right? So from the supplier point of view also, it's much more efficient. If I'm running a more efficient business as a supplier, then I'm also likely to give that or pass that discount or that price on to my buyer. So it works both ways, right? So for buyers, it works to have a supplier portal and to digitally collaborate with the buyer. And for the buyer also, it works. So that's how the buyer starts the cycle. And then you have the end users doing the blue part, right? So they search up catalogs, they buy what they want. What is happening in the tool is you don't have to read a 200 page policy book, or let's say you go to your intranet and read a policy for something each time before you take an action. No, the tool guides you to policy. The tool doesn't let you do something that is out of policy. That is how policy is enforced. So this is much more effective then not having a way to enforce policy and just checking, right? Or doing audits. This is what companies did in the past. They set up a policy and then they do audits or they have to manually check everything, which slows down everything, right? So tools with built-in compliance. And then as you get more advanced, you will see in the AI topics, more and more 
uh, compliance is built into process and process is simplified. That is what AI is doing for you. So anyway, going through this cycle, so then you go from, you request what you want, you order, the supplier is able to confirm, hey, this is what I got, and you get it back. You get confirmations, you get shipping notices, uh, you receive your goods. Then there is something called as touchless invoicing. So compared to paper invoicing, where you have no choice but to take that paper around to whoever ordered the goods and do approvals, and it takes time, right? And then the supplier is calling up the accounts payable department. So people are on the phone, they're always behind payments. So you're not able to pay your suppliers on time, which again leads to other issues. So all this changes when you have a system like this, where you have provided your goods as a supplier, you sent your invoice electronically, and there is a three-way match, right? So if automatically the goods ordered matches the good receipted and the invoice amount, and let's say they're there in this, there are about 90, 100 business rules that are possible, right? So you put all your rules on the network. When the invoice comes in, it automatically checks those 100 rules instead of a account clerk or someone manually trying to check all rules, right? It's already checking for, is it the right tax? Is it the right, um, you know, fields? Is it addressed to the right bill to address, to the right department? These are so many 100 things that can happen, the right unit of measure, you know, uh, currency, all that. There's 100 things that could happen that could go wrong in an invoice. But the tools ensure that all this is correct. And then you're able to electronically or do touchless invoicing. So basically, if three things match, invoice straight goes into payment, and then payment happens on the day it's supposed to get paid. So vendors get paid on time. Uh, you're also able to basically then do what is called as uh, invoice discounting or, you know, you're able to, let's say, say that I, I am running an efficient process. I can pay you um, 30 days earlier than your payment term. So I can realize some savings, some invoice discount saving on it, right? And it can happen both ways. The buyer can initiate it or the supplier can initiate it. Supplier especially needed for working capital. So all these tools are easily enabled by having an end-to-end digital process. So this is the same source to pay process we saw without... Uh, uh, any digital technology, and now we're seeing it in the tool. This this is the process I was talking about, right? So how we are running this sort of process in that sort of tool. Now, what you will find around the world are systems which are running a part of it. And again, it reflects on the maturity of the organization, how much, what part of this is run. Now, when we do, as a company, we do free, procurement maturity assessment for suppliers, uh, for all procurement, for all buyers, right? So we realize that even the best of companies, they are not running this whole process, especially in the tool, they're running 10, 20, 30% of this process. So it's suboptimal. Why it's suboptimal? Either they don't have the right process defined or when the parties that are implementing for them, they're just standing up a system, not really embedding their process, their complexity into the mm -hmm. technology. Or the technology is very cumbersome to actually implement that complexity. So either way, it doesn't work. So the goal is to really get to a point where you get a lot of this enabled and you get savings. Again, to give you an example of how much saving is possible, you're roughly able to save four to five percent or let's say five to six percent across your source to pay by just having a digital process enabled. If you're um, sourcing for something first time in a tool and it's previously unaddressed spend, you will realize more savings. But there are a lot of other parameters. They all add up. Uh, it gives you like, let's say, you're saving on contract leakage, you're saving on compliance, you're saving on, let's say, errors from suppliers and invoices. There could be 100 things. Also, the efficiency of the people working, processing your POs or invoices. So all these things add up. So every billion, if you add up five, six million, it's a lot of money. And it's it's enough money to make the whole transition to e-procurement um, self-funding. This is what I tell all customers that, you know, you should you should go digital because it is self-funding. The consulting you pay for, the licenses you pay for, the whole deployment, your project costs are not significant compared to the value you realize. You break even within six months, nine months, and that is also changing in the industry. With newer tech, 
you implementing in two weeks you're going live in two weeks four weeks like that not six months one year two years to just realize some value right so this is changing so now in the grand scheme of things what is it that you need to do to actually deploy the right kind of tech you need to understand the tech landscape you need to of course understand what your needs are and this is why i was talking in the uh, the start of the day is that what is unfortunately happening in the industry is that what consulting companies are selling to you is basically what they partner with and if they only partner with one or two providers that's all you get regardless of your assessment your needs so to turn it around the right way you have to properly assess the procurement maturity the needs of that org then build the business case up then check is this something scalable can i deploy something a piece of architecture that is scalable or is it a problem when i try to scale up when i try to merge when i try to acquire companies you know is it going to work so or is it going to work with the less rest of my landscape in other domains uh, within my company so all this is stuff that you actually check in your solution fit and then <coughs> what you also need to do <coughs> is very accurate project planning to actually deliver that business case to make that change happen with your suppliers make that change happen within your business the other key aspect here is mobilization of your project stand up the right talent to deliver on that <clears throat> and then how much of what you are also when you're looking to buy this tech how much of it is pre configured as best practice <clears throat> more and more we should be able to adopt now cloud solutions running best practice processes as standard it's gone are the days where you need to really sit through like let's say two months three months of design prepare a blueprint document then some bunch of coders will go and develop something for you then you see actually what i imagined what they wrote versus what they produced there's a huge gap right gone are those days now you're able to do what you hear as agile delivery agile what does it mean really in practical terms it just means okay i have a minimum viable product it's running <clears throat> now i can just run these agile sprints so add a bit more function a bit of configuration a bit of complexity every day thank you and uh, and every day just uh, take it forward a bit one process at a time one sub process at a time uh, or one let's say level 6 process and you're able to build on complexity so now customers go live within weeks and sometimes you can just take in a solution as is and uh, build on it and then what is key is change i think as humans we are reluctant to change so this is always a key aspect of transformation the change management and the knowledge transfer the change management aspect is basically i'm used to doing some things in a certain way now even if something is for your better you're not always embracing change because it is a change from your current comfort zone that is what the change management part of the organization needs to deal with so when you're actually designing solutions we normally as a good practice we're doing change impact assessment which means that we are really seeing it from the user lens and saying okay you're trying to design a process here but this is what they're used to today so in their head this is the change they are going to experience or this is where they will like it not like it and so on i mean i can't believe i i'm going back 20 plus years and um, i was at dell when they introduced ariba there and i can tell you my reaction and now i mean if i think back how stupid i was but you know at the time they um let's say doing some job in some function of dell and they introduced uh, ariba and what it meant for me was or for everybody in the company is now if you need to order something you need to buy through this online tool and which at the time felt like i mean is the company crazy earlier i always had like a a desk or a or a or a cupboard where i had all the office stationery now i need to go into some tool and do something to actually order something for me like i felt at the time it was like you know how how stupid is that 
but now if i look back you know i mean i had no understanding right i'm an end user in the business uh, for me it was a change so um i mean personally what it did for me is like i stopped i didn't bother to order whatever i needed right so that's one good thing for procurement probably it does work but re reality is that even if something is for your better and you don't understand it because it's not your core thing um but it's really improving and digitizing process right so so this change management is important the knowledge transfer so a lot of time consultants come in into a project and they're able to stand up a system for you but if they're not imparting knowledge to your current team your core project team or your business then you will not learn as much so if you if you so what we do normally is we start with a core project team training at the beginning so they know what is art of possible with this project with this digital procurement with this technology what is possible when the business understands it they understand better in their context okay this means this for me so then they are able to basically um leverage the technology better they also able to then deploy the right sort of people for the right sort of roles and do it better so all this is part of uh doing the the knowledge management right the training right to deliver the business case i think with more and more millennials i don't know how many trainings you even do you ever take right do you take trainings or do you just simply assume things to work yeah you just like you are used to taking trainings for for stuff right stuff should work like i see my kids they just think everything should just work you know but in the past it was normal for us to take proper training for everything you know plan it train get trained on it some people even went flew abroad to get some training then came back trained the rest of the team so it was very normal you know the, but the world has really moved on um you need software now that doesn't need training it's intuitive so i'll skip some of this but broadly the principles are simple right you want to transform user experience for everyone you want to have compliant tools you want to have an improved target operating model that we talked about earlier you want to really optimize your uh, framework of buying and sourcing you need are ultimately developing your capability your knowledge capability the cost the adoption of business uh, so all this are some of the key things when you're looking at transformation and transformation is bringing you standardization is bringing you efficiency bringing you agility um now I'll just give you one example and then we move on to um other presentations so this is the kind of assessment approach i was talking about right so you assess the customer's process maturity tech maturity and then you give them a solution so a lot goes in it right stakeholder interviews you under try to understand the maturity of you understand their perspective their pain points you also compare just on procurement practice good or bad you're able to compare them against their um, sector or division and you're able to also see how mature that process is on different things and um, ultimately benchmark their performance versus others right so this is sort of stuff if you want to make improvement you should know where you stand today and where you stand today when you benchmark uh, with others right so this is kind of uh, part of the assessment work you do and then uh, you are able to then move on to the right solution so having said that companies don't do this part right they don't assess they don't do the solutioning right um they don't do the knowledge transfer right so as a result what you're really getting is basically there's challenge in solution selection there's lack of advice as well again it's coming from the fact that the consulting parties only have one or two softwares to offer you so there isn't much selection anyway right you're just using one or the other so with a lot of emerging tech out there now with a lot of other tech this is the what we're trying to bring into the industry is really that this is the new ecosystem and get a better or a broader point of view and choose the right tool for your business for your size of business for your industry and to solve your use cases and if innovation already exists for your industry for something take it um these are some of the other typical challenges business face project cost right because again talent is is really scarce in this so you got the same bunch of 
talent that has used to these technologies are implementing in other places, whether on the customer side or whether on the implementation side, that's the talent that is there. And that talent is moving around uh, on many projects. So that talent also costs a lot. So the cost of implementing technology is very high. And the adoption is minimal because you're just doing suboptimal processes. So overall, all this leads to still very poor uh, value. It doesn't help your business case. So a lot of times companies are just, especially small and medium companies, are not even making that move because they think the amount of money it takes to pay the license, to implement something, to train people, to hire people, it's not worth it. So, you know, it, a lot of it, that's why you don't see. So overall, the industry doesn't move forward because of all this suboptimal stuff. Scalability is another challenge. I think we covered this earlier in the day as well, right? So the impact of such cycles is basically poor ROI, high business costs, and limited value to business. So this has got to change. Um, we covered this also initially, but now I think it will make more sense to you, right? So you look at the transformation holistically, how to embed your process into digital and then drive insights, compliance, and also have the talent to actually understand how this is done. So this is kind of what is important, right? And then this takes you through a maturity journey from what I was telling you earlier. Now digitization is just the first step. It's the basic awareness. A leading company today saves a lot more and a lot more savings, unimagined saving is possible when you come to uh, AI and you have better buying experience, you use market places, you use blockchain, you have risk uh, management um, processes. All this is saving unimagined and earlier, the only saving bar was the first one, the process automation, sourcing and transformation. But now that is the foundation Right. So if you want uh, how to be a leading organization in the world, you need to go beyond reactive spend management, which can be digital, but it's just reactive to go it into more predictive demand management, collaborative demand management, cognitive uh, insights into the business, buying experience, all this. And that will lead you to be a better org. <clears throat> so. I'll skip all this now. And um, you also need a lot of accelerators to actually do this on time. So, and then there's methodology to do it. So we were talking about agile methodology. Agile methodology is basically doing it in a way where you already start from a pre-assembled best practice solution and then have the principles of adopting your processes, adapting, to the requirement, making minimal changes, right? So you adjust, you add new process, you do them like these sprints uh, and you keep adding it. Now, once it is done, then you do integration sprint. So then you are connected with other systems you need to, and then you're able to build the whole system end to end. Train your team and um, yeah, transition them to the new system and then you're ready. So this is kind of, something to to look at now some parts i think in also the other technology or the methodology is really uh high uh, waterfall waterfall means you do one phase and then you go to the next phase and then the next phase so this is how traditionally projects were done in 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 de technology deployment so some parts of those are also uh, worth it right so planning is is useful and you can really plan all the dependencies and then execute. So what we try to recommend is a hybrid agile approach. So you do the system development in an agile way, but you still run the project management in a more waterfall way. Um, architecture, data streams, change management in a more waterfall way. So you know exactly when you finish one phase and start a next phase. And there are lots of uh, assets to do this. So we'll not go in the detail of this, but this is again, just raising awareness for you that how to do an agile project delivery, uh, where to start. And just to summarize now, so you would do assessment and you would establish the target operating model that we saw earlier in the day. So where you stand and what you're building towards. 
then you are trying to build the best practice process into the tool. Okay, so that's the process engineering. And then once that process is there, you are looking at innovation, constantly seeing a way to innovate that. So that is where this, you know, continuous innovation process kicks in. If you don't continuously innovate, you will, some process might be good today, but it's going to be really obsolete five years from now. So you got to continuously innovate to stay ahead of your competition. And then you're able to also, um, once you design the process, you of course need to test and build the solution out and do what it takes to uh, cut over, do the knowledge components, train, and then you're ready to go live. So this, this, is, this is kind of what you need to transform today. So now what we will do is just share a quick example um, of what is reality of a lot of companies. So this is a company, let's say, bought something. What you see in that color, uh, they implemented these modules. But if you compare versus best in class, you will see that, okay, that boost ball represents how mature the process is. And in some cases, the white represents that it's actually process is not even visible. So you have compared to the best practice process we saw earlier or the full process you saw earlier. Now you see what they're doing in this example, that customer is using only three modules. They bought another fourth, which didn't implement because of time, budget, whatever, right? At the same time, look at everything in white. They basically do not have those processes running in that tool. The tool actually supports those processes but they have not configured the system in a way to run those processes or they don't have the procurement maturity to run those processes. So this is really an example of what customers normally across the world are in this situation. Um, and then you got in yellow suboptimal process. So they are running that process, but are they running to the best of functionality available in the tool? No. And only parts in blue are like, okay, it's at least acceptable standard usage, right? So this is a, a very good example of suboptimal, okay? So running a good process, but you need the tool as well, right? So this is high level. So imagine you go through all the pain of a project and project and companies happen once in four or five years, six years. It, it's not an everyday thing, right? So when your company gets that project or when you get a chance to really do go through a transformation case, you got to do a good job of it. Otherwise, you'll be like this. You will have suboptimal process and it's not going to deliver value. If you're going to just run this process, you might as well run it outside the tool, right? So this will never make up your business case. So then the reality is if you do this, you are saving much less compared to what best in class in that tool can do on all the parameters of the business case. So it's not good enough again. Now, if you were to optimize these processes in this example for this customer, if we were to just optimize their process in the same tech, not even replace the tech, you could save almost 25 million uh, in this case, in this example, the customer spent probably about a billion, right? So 25 million. Now, what's the cost of doing such an optimization project? Probably like a million or two, half a million to two million, right? But the saving is 25 million. So the ROI is like good 10 times, 12 times. So it's worth it, right? So it's always worth it if you are able to uh, deploy technology to realize value. So now 